In the darkness Can you hear us When the night comes Are we alone Have you forgotten all of your children When we remember you How we grow But our hearts Cannot Be silent Oh God Be our soul In the night When the Going God, be our hope, be our strength, be our sheltering place, our song in the night. We are broken. Are we forsaken? Has your love gone down with the sun? And your mercy through all history Is it abandoned and undone? Oh, our hearts cannot be silent Oh God, be our soul in the night When the light is gone God, be our hope, be our strength Be our sheltering place a song in the night A song in the night A song in the night Alleluia You wrote it, led me down to the Red Sea. The waters tremble, and you made a way. You raised your arm and led them to dry land. Lord, will you hear us? When we say that our hearts cannot be silent, oh God, be our song in the night when the light is gone. God, be our hope, be our strength. Be our sheltering place Our song in the night 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 You may be seated Psalm 16, 
Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my master. Everything good I have, I have comes from you. The godly people in this land are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their gods. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Thank you, Cohen. Well, good morning, University Christian Church. Good to see so many of you. Thank you for that wave, Stephen. That's really nice. <laughs> and welcome to those of you who are joining on Zoom as well. Good to be together on this final day of February. Um, just a couple invitations for you. Oh, hi, hi, rules. <laughs> when, you, when you sit there, I guess you don't see people come in. Good to see you guys. Um, just a couple of invitations for you this morning before I invite Onia up to the stage. Um, invite you as I do every week to participate in our offering. You can do that by dropping your offering in the white box on your way out. Um, if you're online right now, you can also give online, universitychristianchurch.net, and just invite you to participate in the ongoing work of the ministry here by participating in the offering. A couple save the dates for you. March 14th, 3.14, that's Pi Day for you math geeks out there. Uh, March 14th is our next family meeting. It's going to be, a, uh, I think we're going to do it at 2 o'clock, and we're going to try to keep it one hour. Imagine that. Um, so 2 o'clock, March 14th, is the next family meeting. And then the other meeting, this is far off, but I want you to know about it now. April 25th is going to be our annual congregational meeting where we're going to be voting on the budget for next year. So I'm going to keep reminding you each time I'm up here, um, because it's really important that you all be at that meeting. And yes, the budget will be sent out well in advance of that meeting so that we can look at it together and that there's time for um, questions and other comments and concerns to be, to be answered. Um, so those are the two save the dates. And just one more thing. Um, I don't see Kara Barth here yet, but Kara, I mentioned last week, um, Kara is going to be uh, shaping an hour uh, set aside uh, starting this Thursday for the next seven weeks um, for folks who might want to do a little processing and unpacking of the grief cycle. So Kara is a trained uh, life coach with a particular focus in transitions um, and particularly the grief and loss that can come um, during transitions. And so if you'd like to participate in that, uh, talk to me about it or you can talk to Kara about that. And that's this Thursday from seven to eight o'clock for the next several weeks. Um, I think those are the main announcements. So Onia Okwobi is with us this morning. Um, what can I say about Onia? Onia is the, one of the co-founding elders of 21st Century Church, um, as well as a teaching pastor at 21st Century Church. Um, she is a mom. She is a sociologist. She is almost done with a PhD <laughs> dissertation coming up in April, I just found out. Um, and she's just a wonderful, wonderful person. So it's a gift, Onia, for you to be here with us this morning. Um, the floor is yours. Come on up. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, let's see. There we go. Good. All right. All right. Thank you, Meg, and thank you, UCC. It is always such a privilege to be with you all um, here. And we are grateful at a 21st Century Church to consider ourselves a sister church of yours. As you go through transition and you come out the other side, even more of the church who God has designed you to be, um, we're glad to be able to partner, be here for you, commiserate uh, in all of that as it occurs. 
As I was uh, preparing for this morning, I thought back to a period about three years ago, and it was a tough time for our family because my husband, Dele, had taken a job in Arkansas, and I was still in Columbus finishing my comprehensive exams. And the idea was, after a year, I would move down and join the family in Arkansas. Well, the Arkansas thing didn't really stick. You can come up with your own reasons why that didn't happen. Um, but we ended up back in Cincinnati. But during that time, I had a lot of free time to think and ponder and wonder and do things like go to the movies. So one night, I was in line for a movie, and I clicked on one article, and it led me to another article, and led me to another article, and I got out of line for the movie because I was so excited. And I ended up down this rabbit hole, calling my husband and exclaiming, did you know there's more than one theory of the atonement? And of course, you guys probably knew this already. I did not. And that is after 15 years of being a Christian and a whole seminary degree. I mean, maybe they touched on other theories. Like, there's a whole bunch, a whole bunch of them. Maybe they touched on these, but I had always been under the understanding that, yeah, maybe we dabbled in some other things, but we really figured out why Jesus came. And I learned that night, standing in line for the movie, that that wasn't the case at all. And that opened the door for me to so many new revelations, studies that have really uh, characterized my Christian life over the past three years. It's a process that some people in various degrees call deconstruction. And I know for some people, this process is, is not easy and wonderful. It's hard and difficult and grueling. I think of a friend of mine who lost her mother to cancer when she was expecting a miracle and had to wonder, where was God in this and how does this line up with what I've been taught my whole life? Or for others whose faith looks so different now on the other side where they're not even sure if they have faith anymore. Or even those who have lost their community in the process of asking questions because they're not sure that their community that they're in can hold the questions that they have. But maybe the hardest thing about this process is realizing that you're never again going to have answers as tidy as the ones you started out with. Instead of one theory of the atonement, you now have 10 that you have to wrestle with on a day-to-day -day basis. But when I read our psalm for today, Psalm 131, I start to feel like maybe that's OK. Maybe concrete answers were never what this God thing was about anyway. And maybe when we die to wanting to have all the answers, a new humility can be born in us. And that humility honors God and gives us rest and peace. So I want you to consider that today as we explore this psalm. I'll start through walking through the psalm and the context around it. And I'll end by asking us to consider how we might make this psalm our song. Let's pray. God who is love, we are grateful to you for this gathering, for this space. In the next few minutes as we open up your word, God, I just pray that you would show us again what it means to be in relationship with you. Show us again what it means to humble ourselves before you. Show us again what it means to die to having answers so that we can live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not consider myself, concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. So the first thing we notice is that the psalm is a song of ascents. It is one of the psalms 120 through 134 that are these 15 songs that were regularly recited, sung during the temple service. And the 15 songs corresponded to the 15 steps that sat between the court of the women, where all of the Jewish people could be, and the altar, where only the Jewish men could go. So this inclusive space is the place where this song would have been sung. The other thing that we notice is that this is a psalm of David. 
It's a royal psalm, and that makes the theme of humility that we find in it even that much more beautiful, because we have a king speaking of humility. And we know David was not always the greatest guy. He used his power in insidious ways for rape, for murder, for um, conquest that we might not have agreed with. But again, that for me is probably all the more reason why he needed to come back to this place of humility, saying, if I don't do this, I have enough power over other people that I could misuse it and be mistrusted. And so I come back to this place in my attitude of my heart. He starts off by singing, my heart is not proud, meaning my emotional and intellectual life is characterized by humility. Well, the heart uh, in his thinking would not have just been a seat of emotions, but it's the place where all of the thoughts came from. The idea that one's heart is not proud contrasted David with other kings that we see in scripture. For example, God says of the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28 too, in the pride of your heart, you say that I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. This king of Tyre, who instead of exercising humility and not allowing pride to seep into his thought life and his emotional life, uh, instead decided to make himself like God and was spectacularly conquered. Whereas David, who exercised this humility, was called a man after God's own heart. The next bit is my eyes are not haughty. And where in some contexts, eyes speaks to even actions, here it, it seems to talk more about how you are looking at others in the world. My eyes are not haughty or lofty or lifted up, says that I'm not looking down on other people. Again, as a king, this attitude is important because you're probably literally looking down at all of other people all the time, like physically. I don't know if any of you guys watched The Crown, but one of the episodes that got me the most was like that episode where uh, soon-to-be Princess Diana is trying to figure out who to curtsy to in what order. <laughs> and she's like spinning around in a circle and she's all confused. I can't imagine what it does to your head if people are constantly bowing and curtsying to you. Um, and this is the position that David was in. And so putting that with this idea of saying, even in that position, where I am physically looking down on others because they're always bowing, I, my eyes are not going to be haughty. I am not going to choose to look down on others. Haughty eyes, you know, they wreck the image of God and other people when we decide to elevate ourselves above other people. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's listed in Proverbs 6 as one of the seven things that God hates. God hates it when we lift up our eyes above other people. Perhaps we in here are not kings, so we can't necessarily relate to that, but it is still true that we look down on other people. I know this because as a sociologist, one of the areas I do research on is status. And we're just about to publish a paper that talks about the idea that our status hierarchies haven't changed a lot in most areas over the past 20 years. We still look down on people by race, we still look down on people by gender. We still look down on people by occupation. I mean, I see that all over my social media feeds as people talk about what the minimum wage should be, right? You know, this idea that I always ask in my classes, is the doctor more important than the sanitation worker? Because if either one doesn't do their job, what happens? We get sick and die <laughs> if we were surrounded by trash. And so the idea of one deserving something and the other not um, is just a different form of having haughty eyes. A king would be the king of a dung heap without the person who takes out and empties his latrine. And so David knew this when he is saying, my eyes are not haughty. And God is asking us the same, that we examine the, the attitude that we look at other people with when we forget. Finally, in this first verse, David says, I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Which I think in the clearest form says, I don't covet God's place. Because that's the only place where matters are too great or too wonderful for me. I concern myself with lots of things. But we hate that, like in our, our gut, we hate the idea that there might be something above our uh, pay grade, so to speak. 
That doesn't mean that David didn't discern or think or do great things. It's just that he knows where that upper limit is. That's God territory, and that's not our territory. And when I think about that, I can't help but think about the Garden of Eden, where you had Adam and Eve given a beautiful garden and asked just not to eat off of one tree out of all the trees. But yet, they were tempted. The serpent said, God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. The funny thing is, they were already like God. They were made in the image of God. They were given care over the earth. They were given um, so much responsibility over things. But yet, this one thing they couldn't have, they grasped that. They grasped that wanting to displace God and instead ended up displaced from God in a way that we are still trying to heal uh, centuries later. Why are we so slow to thank God for the thousands of trees we can eat from and so quick to curse God for the one we can't? David was king, and in the earthly realm with his own kingdom, he could do pretty much anything. But he wanted to remind himself that there was a realm reserved for God, and he didn't want any part of it. Now, this is a beautiful picture of humility from this king. The idea that he said, he declared that he had emotion and thoughts that elevated God and not himself. That he had eyes to see others as made in the image of God and not to look down on anyone. And a scope of activity that honors what is uniquely God's and does action in what is his to do. But you know, the funny thing even about this picture of humility that I see is usually the people who are most humble don't write a song and go around singing about how humble they are. <laughs> so part of me thinks that David doth protest a bit too much. And I feel like that is where the second voice of this psalm comes in. Verse 2, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. So why do I think that there's a second voice here? Well, translators have had a really tough time with the scripture. Uh, because if you look at the, the words, the Hebrew words in it, that second part of this verse is most accurately translated like the weaned child that is with me. Not like any old weaned child, but like a weaned child that is literally laying on me. And so that wouldn't have been something David sung. So perhaps, just perhaps, there's a second voice of a woman popping into the psalm to show us what true humility looks like that she is the expert on humility and not the king because she sees this child that is with her, like this child in the back. You're the woman of the psalm. <laughs> and is giving us this picture that we can absorb and hold on to. And for me, that's only fitting that it was done on these steps between the court of the woman and the altar. This place where men and women would be gathered together in worship, we hear the voice of a king and the voice of a mother speaking to the same thing together. We see some wonderful things that are revealed in this changing of voice. The first thing is in the sweetness and beauty of this declaration, we see the ability of this mama to see the image of God in herself. She knows what it's like to hold and reassure a child. And she knows that God is holding her soul in the same way. There's a pastor, you know, around 1895, uh, Henry McNeil Turner, and he was a bishop and he was an elected state representative until Georgia kicked all the black folks out of the state senate, so did everybody else, by the way. Um, but he got a lot of flack for a sermon that he preached because he preached a sermon saying, God is a Negro. He reasoned that if white folks can see God as white, why couldn't black folks see God as black? After all, we're all made in the image of God. And one of the lines from this sermon stirred my heart because he said, 
God have, any, God have mercy on any group of people who don't believe that they look like God. God have mercy on any group of people who don't believe they look like God. Because when we forget that we're image bearers, we accept less than what God has for us. We, we lower ourselves below the standard that God has for us as, as people who are, are created in his image and people who um, God has intention for. Turner knew this. And so he was encouraging black folks in that direction to see yourself in this way. And I think that this woman knows it too. Despite having limitations on her life, places she couldn't go up the steps, places that she couldn't go, having a marginalized role in society, she can see the image of God in herself. And I pray today nothing less for the rest of us in here. I think the other thing to, to absorb from this place, I was um, talking with a friend of mine the other day who's newer in the Lord. And we were talking about intimacy and our mothers and the things that we got or didn't got or understood or didn't understand. And I read for her this psalm. And I said, if you want intimacy, you can just lay back in the arms of God, your mama. And she kind of looked at me with a look. She's just like, I can do that? I thought I could only see God as my father. I can see God as my mother. That's okay. Almost as if it was like some dirty little secret. But God is often referred to in the scriptures with female imagery as someone who gave us birth or as a, a chicken who's gathering her hens underneath herself or even as this woman in the scripture who is allowing the weaned child to rest against her. And so if that's the image of God that you need, either because you had a great relationship or a difficult relationship with your mother, or you need those things that are rightly or wrongly associated with mothers, I encourage you today to grab onto that image for yourself and hold on to it. If it either helps you see God as what you need for today or helps you see yourself made in the image of God. The second thing I see in this changing of voice is the beauty of humility as a message for all. I think one of the trickiest parts about trying to do churches that are inclusive is that some people seem to need a different message based on their social location than others need. In fact, I ran across this problem in a, a consulting job I was doing recently for a church in DC. And this woman I was speaking to, I felt put it perfectly. She said, when you're a powerful person, the gospel is often telling you to lay down your power and serve the one who doesn't have any power. But when I'm over at my other church, that's a predominantly black working class church, the messages are about empowerment and much more of us speaking to people that are in the struggle. And I don't think that they're like ever speaking to that reality because it's not the dominant reality at our church. I see that that's a real challenge of how do we be a church where people can receive what they need to hear. When for so many people, they don't really need to be humbled. They need to be lifted up. Well, for me, this psalm in three short verses speaks to both the powerful and those in need of empowerment. Because humility, as we understand it, is not just something that lowers us. It's something that recalibrates us into the right position. So for the king, for the powerful, for someone who, who has the ability to influence the lives of other people, what they need to hear in humility is, yes, maybe I have power, but there's one who is more powerful than I am. I am not God. And if I mistreat other people, then I'm going to be accountable for it. But the marginalized at the same time hearing this message of humility can say, yes, I may be humble, but I'm an equally an image bearer. And I know that anyone who seems to have power over me in these earthly realms, that that's an illusion, that that's gonna fall away, that that's gonna collapse. And so I too can stand before kings because I am made in the image of God, just like you. Humility helps us understand that we are powerful, agentic, capable, created things. And that's enough that we don't have to be creator. We have two voices and a place where every Jewish person, male and female, could hear. This psalm speaks to the inclusion of us all 
and this message of humility. But the question that remains open is, how do we get here? Because the hard part is it's really hard for us to hum humble ourselves before anybody, even God. And the reason why is because we've seen trust so misused. We've seen authorities, political leaders, religious leaders, parents, misuse that authority in ways that have hurt and cause us to say, I'm gonna take care of myself. I'm gonna figure out things for myself in ways that makes it hard to even trust and believe in God. And so for that solution, we turn to the weaned child. And I got flipped around on this as I was preparing for this message. Actually, this morning, I got flipped around on this. Because I now, I was thinking previously that out of humility comes the rest of the weaned child. But I think it's actually the other way around. I think the rest comes first. And when you begin to understand presence, that's where you're recalibrated. That's where you're placed in your right position. That's where humility is possible. I mean, we saw it, see it over and over again in scripture, whether it be Job or Isaiah or Mary. One touch, one encounter with the living God, and we're put right. Not in a way that subdues or, or squishes who we are, but in a way that makes us fully who we are in God's presence. You see, a weaned child is very different from an actively nursing child. Nursing children are insatiable, in a word. And honestly, not just when they're hungry. So when 11 years ago, when I had my daughter, I had you know, one of those extensive birth plans and the best laid things, and all the mommy bloggers at the time said, you don't want to use a pacifier, so I hadn't planned to use one. But then the nurse at the hospital explained to me what that meant. If you don't use a pacifier, guess who gets to be the pacifier? You. <laughs> you are the pacifier. So about 30 minutes and two sore nipples later, I'm like, and what colors do those pacifiers come in? It was a good decision. But a weaned child is completely different. They're not rooting around looking for, for milk. They're not rooting around looking for anything. The weaned child is content to be with her mama. And the weaned child has a choice in this. There's no uh, compulsion. You don't have to be there. You can get your food from someplace else. You choose to be close and to be comforted. And as the weaned child lays back, sits back and matches breathing with his mama, he's satisfied. How long has it been since you've been satisfied in God's presence? How long has it been since you've laid back without a care in the world and understood that you were held or come to grow in the understanding that you were held? The satisfaction of the weaned child is why Psalm 131 doesn't need to end with any petition. Even though it starts off addressing God, the psalmist doesn't need to ask for anything in this place of rest. From there, the injunction goes to the people. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. And it's important that this address moves from these voices to the whole community. Because when we choose presence that breeds humility and hope that comes along with it, it's really hard to do by ourselves. It feels so countercultural to give up any part of the rights that we could be striving for and choose humility, to choose rest, to choose the quiet places. But when we have a community that's doing it with us, we become that much more able to fight arrogance and to fight self-reliance. It's so much more possible together. And so maybe we even appropriate this verse a little bit today, and we say, UCC, Put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. We're in the season of Lent, a season of spiritual preparation prior to Easter that's marked by fasting, praying, and giving. Inappropriately, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday with the idea that we are dust, and to dust we will return. It's not meant to hurt us. But it's meant to put us in a place where we can know we don't have all the answers, 
where it can take the pressure off of us. <laughs> I can just be dust, and I can know that I serve a God who knows what to do with dust. And so in our deconstructing, reconstructing, and deconstructing again, perhaps the posture we need is not to be simple, not to go for pat answers, not to stop asking the questions, but to take the trust of a child as we do it. My friend who I mentioned at the beginning who lost her mother never really got an answer to her questions. But the conclusion that she did come to was, I've tried life with God, and I've tried life without God, and it's way better with God. She was able to know what she could, to be contented in what she couldn't, and to rest and trust. So now I turn to you and ask, and I ask you to just close your eyes for a second, listen to your breathing, Pretend like you're laid back against God, your mama. And God, mama, is not one of these angular, skinny gods. God is like nice and fluffy and comfortable, warm. And ask, in a world that's obsessed with figuring things out, what would it take to really know that God already has? God is for you and with you and that you can find peace without striving in the arms of God, our mother. Continue to reflect on that. You're welcome to stay in that space of reflection if you like, as we move in time, move into a time of prayer together. So as always, we invite you to voice your prayers aloud as you feel led. You can also use this as a time of just silent and quiet reflection as well, whatever feels right to you today. So let's stay before the Lord, being held by the Lord. Let's go before him together. Creator God, you are good. Thank you, Lord, that you make yourself known to us, that you desire to hold us and comfort us and bring us peace. Lord, help us to rest in that promise and to trust even when we don't have the answers, even when we don't have it figured out, even when we have doubts. Lord, that you are with us. Father God, Mother God, Spirit, Jesus, won't you hold us up and hold us together 
as your church. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? Cada hogar y corazón canta al Señor que de nuestras vidas bondad y esperanza que la alegría sea nuestro moto. Still, 
Will say. 
bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's face turn towards you and give you peace. Will you join me in our doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. May you go in peace.